Do you want uh, to first? Streaming. Streaming setup. Should be set up for listening. Okay, one of, yeah, for listening, you set it up. You yeah, 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 I, we are set it up with Marius. Right, so, so start it at one to thing. Yep. Excellent. Okay, that's what I was just going to check. Um, also, I was going to talk about the groups. Yeah, you can do it first. Very, very, just, just to say um, that. Uh, that's my machine. Oh, that's your machine. You want on the PC? My problem is my list of courses. I have to scroll. <laughs> I take it you don't have like under my courses. You don't have quite as long a list as I have of all the courses that I'm involved in. So unfortunately, I've got lots of courses. So anytime you contact me, you need to say which course you're talking about, right? Because I've got too many courses to work out where you're from. But um, I've put up an announcement. Hopefully, some of you saw it. Um, for sign up to group for submission. Um, so this is apparently how Blackboard does its groups, is that you click in here and you get this in right to sign up for different groups. Um, and um, these were automatically generated, which is why the numbers go 1, 10, because it generates the numbers and then sorts them alphabetically. And so that's, yeah. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, the, real, the, the lower group numbers are down here. If I go into, um, so within these groups, these are the group numbers that were in the um, Excel spreadsheet. I need you guys to sign in to the groups that you were in. Um, that's partly so you can submit as a group in, in um, Blackboard, right? Because if you're not listed in the group, you can't submit to the assignment, okay? And so there's one group submission um, that Kurt for the assignment, so that will happen at the end, um, at the end of the submission. It also allows you to have like file transfer things and a whole bunch of other sharing tools. Um, we can add blogs and a whole bunch of weird other stuff in here, um, but at the moment, if you can sign up for those groups, people who don't have a group, um, so there is at least a group of five or six people who have said, I missed the group allocation stuff, I'm not listed in the group. Um, for people who need to be in a group, at the end of the session, uh, we'll put those people who are here. So how many people who aren't in a group are here? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We'll probably create two groups of you guys who haven't been allocated into a group now, uh, and we'll try and make sure we've got everybody in a group um, so that you guys can then do some alterations and do the assignment. Okay, so we'll do that at the end of the session. Um, today's session is going to be done by Christopher, so um, you guys haven't had Marius yet as a lecturer, have you? No. So this will be your third lecturer. We have a fourth lecturer who will be involved in the course. So you're getting a kind of a wide selection, a buffet of, of lecturing um, from around the world. Mm. Um, so uh, Christopher is German background, but also, as I said, a, like a heavy New Zealand influence. So you'll swear like a New Zealander. So <laughs> um, so please forgive us for swearing too much. New Zealand's a bit like Northern Norway, <laughs> right? Where we swear a lot, but it's cultural, so it's okay. <coughs> um, so yeah, but uh, yep, and if you guys can sign up for that. 
Um, that just has to be done by the 14th when you submit the assignment, okay? But make sure you sign up for your group number for 14th or else it won't be included in the grade. Okay? Cool. cool. Well, <coughs> now we're switching to me. I'm wearing a microphone, so it's actually properly recorded, I believe, yeah, right? So... Otherwise, it looks a bit weird. So, yes, yeah, so I'm kind of from New Zealand as well right now to uh, just compliment the whole team. It appears you're only allowed to teach if you uh, teach on game areas or game design area if you from have lived in New Zealand at least for some time. That seems very good. And the reference to swearing is, uh, yeah, arguably Kiwis swear a lot, yes. But the problem is they do it in front of everyone, whether kids around or not. So that's, that's the tricky bit, you know. So... There's something, sensitivity I need to regain from my origin. So um, what am I talking about? It's a good question. Um, I found out yesterday, no, a bit earlier than that. But um, we're talking about teams and documents. So it seems to be like an odd mix, teams and documents. Um, I think it should, um, for, you, for you guys, it should relate to what you're currently doing, right? So you had hopefully an initial um, experience with teamwork in your, in your groups of six and so on. Um <coughs> But there's obviously some specifics we need to look at when we're looking at games or development of game uh, groups. Uh, or so, sorry, uh, development of games in general and the group composition aspects, uh, but also how to ensure that the group has a shared vision. So how did we do that, give you a shared vision? D does anyone remember from Friday? It was the reason why I attended Friday, just to see the, the dynamic that would emerge. How, how did you guys get a shared vision onto your... Uh, project you actually did. Is there anyone? Yep. Yeah, so we have your bear, right? Yes. So what did the bear do in your group? It decided on the game, right? So did your other group members have some influence as well? Oh, cool. Okay. Just checking. Cool. So when everyone agreed, it was consensus, basically. Okay, so but you didn't have any conflicts because you know ultimately you had six group members and surprise surprise there may actually be some ties but nobody had any experience any problems with that yet. Just checking, cool. Okay, um, sweet. Did you talk about the role of uh, the tiebreaker? Uh, like the okay, we don't need that, right? So. Cool. So uh, it, it seems everything flows well so far, and I'm not sure if you're already sitting in your own groups here. It would be an indicator that your group uh, culture is kind of well developed, but I doubt it so far. But as far as I've seen, sl slides are visible. Cool. So uh, last week uh, um, we heard about uh, user-centered design, right? So there was a lot about Gestalt philosophy, uh, psychology aspects like that. And uh, on Friday, that was complemented with you thinking about a uh, game in the first place. So not so much looking at the aesthetic things, but a bit more at the gameplay, the rules and so on. Something you are ne need to explore. Again, I think b in the first lecture, Simon talked about the different aspects of game that come to play. And uh, today we're looking actually really more about uh, at the kind of... Uh, infrastructural aspects of making a game in the sense that you need to have the right team composition uh, or uh, which mechanics of the team um, or interaction in the team you need to have to ensure that you have a success in your project. Because ultimately game development, in fact any application development, in fact any uh, sort of endeavor, human endeavor is likely ending up in a project because we rely on multiple people to do a shared task, right? So it's the kind of 
thing we uh, have in common. Um, but obviously, we're framing it a bit more around games, hopefully at least, and um, with particular reference to the uh, chapters um, 25 and 26 in a second edition of that book. So if you still haven't had a look at it, it's probably a good opportunity to do so. And especially if you don't get my accent, then it's even easier to just reread and you'll be way faster than spending your three hours listening to me and what I'm trying to do here. So, but it's a good point, it's really readable. I'm actually surprised by it because I just uh, basically read this book uh, before I started teaching here and it's I find it very consumable, um, even you know if you take a bit um, tiny chunks out of it. Anyway, cool. Um, there's another uh, thing, we are in the latter part of this uh, lecture we're talking about design documents or documentation in general and there's um, a link and uh, examples on Blackboard as well. I hope you guys are actively using Blackboard. Yes, are they? Yeah, so but it probably is worthwhile regular uh, to, to you know to check in regularly because basically it has a good notification area of all your courses but uh, do that regularly because else you'll be surprised by sudden uh, uh, information that you have may have missed out on. One of the other things about uh, team and project um, in the widest sense is also that you probably need to convey your information, you need to communicate, right? So you make decisions at a team, you prepare a project uh, and work on it, and then you probably need to present it somewhere. And that's something you will need to do in the future and someone else needs to do now, and that will most likely be the third years that are actually having uh, creating uh, games uh, right now and having some proposals that they want to pitch to someone and the someone will be you. So uh, you will be the judges of someone else pitching their games, but bear in mind in two years it will be you, right? So or at least for some of you, unless you want to switch down the application tra track quickly <laughs> after that experience, but that's an option. So um, do the third years know about this already? Oh, they don't know about it, yeah? But you know, so you have a head start. Um, so, okay, okay, so you can get out your pencils already and uh, uh, figure out some nasty questions. So, um, so this course is obviously centered around the book again, and one thing we talk about is one selected lens that relates to teamwork, and that's the lens 100. I like this number, that's why I memorized it. It's the uh, lens of love, as it seems, and it's really about love in the um, commitment sense for the thing you're actually doing, right? So, welcome. Um, for the thing you're actually doing, so um, the project you're actually choosing uh, to to do. I'm, I'm trying to keep it a bit abstract, but in fact, what I want to say is for the game you're developing, right? So you need to have a um, shared understanding and you need to have a shared commitment and um, it's kind of aligned uh, with respect to multiple aspects that uh, relate to the game. But as in teamwork, and I hope you won't experience this in the first, this very first assignment right now at least, um, there will always be disagreements, right? So there are mechanisms of dealing with this one, with those ones, but more importantly, you need to have strategies, systematic strategies of dealing with conflicts in team environment, but uh, also think about what's the underlying goal that you all share in common. And one um, life lesson that I took here from uh, Simon in this particular case um, is really quite simple and straightforward. I read it to you, but it should be super obvious. Everyone on the team has a deep and true love for the game they're making together and for the audience they're making it for. All difference and disagreements will be set aside in service of bringing the game into existence and making it uh, be as wonderful as it can be. Any surprises there? What can we exchange the word game for here? project will do, right? So, yes. But depending on what kind of project, you could also substitute for country, right? So it's a shared cause, right? That's the kind of thing. That's what it primes you for. It's really looking at this object, the game, uh, as a um, you know shared vision that you all want to bring about. And only then you can deal with conflict, set them aside, and keep that in mind. And this is precisely what uh, in this book is highlighted as the solution. You need to ensure that the team loves the game. It doesn't. The team doesn't need to love itself, probably shouldn't love itself, Perhaps they do, N nobody knows. But the point is, it, you should love that game, the thing you're actually doing, yeah? Commitment to the things. Again, remember, your roles represent the role in your team, you know? It's not you as a person, necessarily, um, that is um, uh, subjected or criticized and so on. So, but uh, you obviously have some challenges there that uh, could be along the lines of um, having team members that are simply incapable of loving any game, yeah? Before I taught, uh, thought about teaching in the area of game technology, I thought I was incapable of loving any game. 
but it uh, turns out may not be necessarily true. Point is, if you have a team and there is a developer on there that actually doesn't like, like games, it's probably the wrongest place to be, right? So again, could be a reflection. Do you want to be in an environment um, that you actually probably don't really um, fit in? But worse than that, I think that's the first one is quite easy, right? So if you're not a gamer, you don't have the commitment, the experience, and the uh, don't li you know uh, like elements, um, then you are obviously off a bit. Um, more tricky, however, uh, is to figure out what happens if you kind of have a different game in mind that you think you're making with your team, right? So what happens if your team is not really aligned in its vision? Yeah. So, for example, some of you may want to uh, create strategy games. The other ones are more into first-person shooters. You know, how do you bring those those people uh, um, uh, on the same page, right? So it's quite important that uh, earlier uh, earlier on the track, during the design of the game, or bef in fact before you actually pitch it, I would suggest you probably would want to have a uniform uh, perspective on what the game will actually be about, what will be at the core of the game um, that you actually develop. And again, I think that's still quite a feasible because people can still say, "Nah, sorry, I don't want to be part of that team. Uh, let me opt out here." Note that a shift in perspective may also mean that team members would leave a project, but in a team, uh, or sorry, in a game development uh, environment, you most likely have multiple teams anyway. So it wouldn't necessarily mean abandoning that person, but probably shifting to a different team, different project, right? Different persons have different preferences there. And um, but the more tricky one, I believe, at least um, as far as I understand it is that team members will simply have d uh, sim different kind of visions for the game that, that they are development, developing. So it's not really the genre. I think it's a term to be uh, used with care uh, here in this course, because li Sam doesn't really like genres, uh, the classical genres anyway. Um, but um, it's really about um, what's the focus of this game here right now, right? So in the book, there's an example about a pirate game where the designers were inherently focused on uh, having uh, beautifully animated pirates. Yep. Perhaps you have an example? No, uh, I was, was going to ask. Yep. Are you worried about the team? Are you talking about the team that have been put together? The team that have been formed? Well, that's a good question. I think both is possible because it really depends if you are, you know, kind of your indie uh, startup um, developing group, then it's kind of probably more self selected. If you're part of a member of a bigger company, you're most likely put into projects because your previous project is over and you want to figure out can you participate in the next game project. If not, you're shifting to the next uh, group and so on. So, I mean, it should be indifferent of that. Uh, that. So, naturally, we won't always have the freedom to choose and pick what we like, you know? So, it's always within constraints of the bigger picture. It's like the uh, same for application developers. If you're in a bigger company, you're most likely supporting the product has already been developed, right? And supporting it on and uh, join that team or perhaps don't join that team or another uh, project. But if you're starting from scratch, you're making your own startup, well, you know, you pick the people. Mm -hmm. But that was my question, how did we do part of a selection? There was one question that we asked you guys as well um, when actually set the choosing your animal of choice, like your, your role of choice. What was the question we were asking? Right? So, so there was an indication what kind of game, well, you know, a card game, board game, physical and so on. So this is uh, already some element of priming that sets you in the right mode of thinking. You know, what kind of, obviously, again, you can uh, uh, go deeper and actually find, you know, have a more fine game categorization. But at that stage, you kind of should have been aligned in the vision, okay, we're actually working on a board game, right? Yes. Well, but this is a particular strategy you're assuming. Not everyone may have that strategy. Some may have a strategy to have the best game, but not necessarily the best grade. So it's two different, could be two different things, right? So the strategy, is did you decide on the strategy or just on the game you're actually doing? Okay. So you're kind of aligned about the, the, the strategy, okay. Well, that is something that unites you as a team. What would be the equivalence if you're out in the, you know, um, in the real world? What would be the equivalence there? What would be your strategy there? 
you won't get grades, right? So if you're producing a game, so what's your strategy in the in the, in the real? Exactly, right? So in this case, it, it relates. Uh, it's a purely utilitarian, economic, rational thinking, right? So you want to make a maximum out of the game. But that's some sort of alignment that you have within your group. So you know, so you you need to make it happen in order to actually achieve the best for for. Um, individually or as a group. So in your case, grades are the equivalent to some sort of profit. Yes. So so that's a fi that's fine. So you have a they have a shared conception. Um, but this focus here is really more uh, relevant to the particular game theme that we're looking at, right? Uh, what genre? But you're right. The team in itself needs to have a kind of a shared commitment. Why am I doing this? And you need to have a shared commitment to the thing you're actually working on, whatever the secondary motives actually are. Right, so that's quite important. But obviously, I think making money is always part of it. But for example, if you're starting off and you're entering the industry, making money is probably secondary. It's more about being. What would be the um, first game you probably would do as your startup? What would be the first objective, most likely? Anyone? Uh, yeah, for fun. What? What? In addition to fun, fun is always good. So scoping is important. You need to make something that actually you finish, right? So you don't want to have an unfinished project. There was some, yep. Did, did everyone hear that? What happened? No? So um, so various pointers. So uh, why do you make games? Uh, well, one reason could be obviously fun. That's cool. The other uh, re um, pointer was you want to have a game of a good scope so actually you can finish it. So it shouldn't be too hard in the beginning. So you start simple. And there was a very good important point here to get visibility. Right, so other people notice you as a as a studio, for example, as a game studio. So it may not be the profit, may actually be a loss, but it's kind of a long-term investment. If you want to think about profit, sometimes you need to uh, uh, hold back with your immediate economic um, uh, interests, but actually look at the long term and gain success there. So it really depends what your strategy, long-term strategy as a studio is. Right, if you do it one-off assignment, yeah, go for the money. Right, no, th there's no harm. If you and your group, however, were forged together for a longer time period throughout the semester, perhaps your strategy would be slightly different, right? So yeah. Cool. Um, so that's that's basically a point here. You need to get uh, everyone on board. For example, secondary people would be keen in exploiting the hardware that's available, and I think the artists would probably be focusing on aesthetics, right? So having um, uh, very refined models of individual players and so on, but that may be at the sacrifice of the gameplay to some extent. So it's also an element of balancing those characteristics of games um, and obviously the team interest, because your team will be composed of different types of members that don't only have different roles, but also different occupations, right? Being designer, artists, um, uh, developers, and so on. So it's something to uh, bear in mind. So those are the warning signs that things don't really work. But the key driver, I guess that's more, that was the, the previous slide. Which animal did the previous slide relate to most in your team? Which, who would ask those questions if you were in your, in your team? There was this animal, yep. Yeah, the Google would be, I think, a good candidate. Yeah, anyone else? Yes, process, yeah, yeah, to th there's not really a time element there. It's more like the general, you know, do we get things going? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in the right area. The cat, right? That nasty one. So it probably really asks, okay, why are we why are we really on the right track here? Should we really do that endeavor, you know, uh, or should we just leave it? So, but I think you you get the gist here, right? So again, it reflects your role. Um, but what combines you in your in your vision, hopefully, should be that you kind of love the audience as well. So it's not only you're doing the game, but you actually also want to love the no, well, you know, in, in whatever abstract or concrete fashion, want to love the audience of your game, right? If you write a game s for your girlfriend, that's quite obvious because then it's really uniform. But if your audience is like, uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, millennials, male, um, then, you know, love has a different meaning here, but it's still about dedication to that understanding, the uh, desires and the, 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 the interest of the audience, right? So soccer games probably have a particular group, uh, target group that uh, they appeal to. So you need to know your audience, need to know what makes them, uh, you know, get going, what makes them uh, uh, want to play your game and stick to it, right? So it's uh, quite important. I think you mentioned um, an interesting, uh, I, I just borrow Simon's anecdote. He was uh, referring to a small New Zealand game company that was actually into, what is it, tank games, right? It was into tank games. And their 
Um, so they really, you know, were very immersed in the idea and following the um, uh, vision of having a shared tank game. So profitable target group, any guesses? What would be a typical target group of that? History, yeah, okay, cool, yep, what else, yep. If you wanna, yep, again. And tank enthusiasts, yeah, yep. Yeah. Do you wanna attach a persona perhaps to it? Like to get a more, what would be, you know, I if you close your eyes and you think about the person playing those games, what would come to mind? What would be some aspect? Talked about personas in the past sessions. Oh yeah, military, yeah, cool, what age? Okay, cool. Cool, yeah. Okay, yeah, more mailbox, okay, cool. So, um, cool. Any other thoughts? No? Yes. Yeah? Around 20s. Around 20s, yeah. So I think it's a reasonable reasonable age group, yep. So, but we have a broad range of interests, but they kind of combine, right? Historical interests, male, mid-20s, military, and so on, all those elements. So they were bought by Mattel. And uh, you guys know Mattel from other, from more physical games, I guess, but they're also into, you know, obviously digital games nowadays. And guess what they need to develop after that? Any guesses? There you go, right? So, uh, Barbie games was the answer. So there you go. Um, and if you think about a team that has a shared vision, right, on tank games, they really unite and really are into it for various reasons. And how excited will they be to, be, uh, to create Barbie beach games? Beach vacation, there you go, with Ken and all the rest of it. So um, probably not, right? So in this case, you really kind of need to twist your mind. So you need to think, okay, what is it that makes the audience tick at least? And we commit to actually producing that shared vision, that shared game together, because most likely you will not fall in love with your game, or may not. Did they fall in love with the game? Mm, yeah, they, they, they tried. <laughs> Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. So a different perspective. Something, something that's what you like is not necessarily what you want to do or create. Is that right understanding I have um, conveyed here? So it may also, you know, it may be a shift in in mind to what you are actually a target group of, as opposed to what you feel like you want to. Um, produce for or whom you want to produce for yeah so it's another point there. so you don't always have that freedom right so the bigger your studio gets the less probably freedom you may or may not uh, actually um, get so the idea is there if you still can't uh, deal with it kind of fake it and try to understand the audience and try to inject it I'm I'm kind of a cat on that one I really don't uh, like the idea of faking things so the moralist comes out but um, you know to some extent obviously you need to bend your objective because ultimately it's about making profit, I guess, right? So uh, unless you have secondary goals attached to it. Cool. So um, and <coughs> that's basically the idea is um, to get into it, right? So um, one um, um, motivator, does anyone know Ni Nikola Tesla? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. OK. They have all the physics here. Cool. Right. Yeah. Any backgrounds? Any intuitions? No? What is? Yeah. Right, right. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that is probably most uh, more accurate uh, depiction, yeah. Yes, and that's precisely what that citation reflects. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in love with the pigeon is another statement here. So again, that, that uh, highlights the oddities of that person. As an okay, okay, it's getting scary here. So I shouldn't have asked that question, should I? But uh, at least you know your stuff, so that's good. But the point is, it's really about getting into it, right? Getting all your emotions, your energy, and your productivity into something uh, that, that that sets you um, free from other 
physical necessities, which is not necessarily a good thing. Forgetting about food, uh, sleep, and the like is not necessarily helpful, and may also not be really appealing to your target audience. Anyway, cool. Um, Sweet. Apart from, um, I think I motivated that enough here, um, but apart from actually having a shared vision, you obviously need to want to have a s notion of ownership as well. For example, in your teams, right? So we explicitly said that there's no distinct leader as such, right? So it's always, yeah, there's a leading figure, I guess, or like the strategic visionary, but under the hood, the everyone has a considerable influence in shaping a project. Uh, you know, with all the abilities to um, have, have sh indicate warning signs, facilitate things, and making things happen. It won't work with all the members involved to some extent. And um, the important thing is here is actually that you want to include everyone uh, in uh, the design process because by also only concentrating on the visionaries, the bears in our uh, metaphor here, we probably would only get a subset of the possible good ideas you can work with. Yeah? Also, having a too strong sti uh, team and forcing leaders or for forcing followers to be aligned with their leader wouldn't necessarily help productivity either. So the idea is really that everyone has a share of the ownership in that product you're making, right? So there's a strong stake in it. And that's why you would want to include everyone in the discussion. Um, identify flawed ideas. Again, that would be an animal uh, challenge, I suspect. And um, look at the games from multiple perspectives. Yeah. The more people, the more perspectives. What's the downside with um, a large number of people? Larger teams, the more perspective, yep. Yes, right, so consensus, oh yeah, it takes ages, right? Because yeah, it's ex exactly if everyone should have ownership and we have a large number of teams, everyone has to say something, yeah? Right, you could actually be drawn in different directions or look at different things, right, or even perhaps across different genres. So there's always a trade-off on uh, making that uh, happen in a way that on the one hand, everybody feels involved and has ownership in the project. On the other hand, the individuals, um, you, has, you have a more focused subset of um, that, that uh, development team that actually can focus on individual aspects, right? So the idea is there that if you discuss uh, or develop a game idea or project idea or application idea in the widest sense that you use the entire steam, uh, team to source ideas, right, to do ba brainstorming in the widest sense and use a core team, some sort of you know, possible designers or self-select, it really depends on the very concrete problem you're facing to uh, have a specific design and um, obviously prepare some sort of documentation or in some sort of other way presented or communicated with the wider team and then actually present it to the team to get feedback on that one right so kind of like like a f kind of a focus subset focal subset of the entire team working on the concrete forming of the idea right and then you can uh, reiterate in this process and actually have the cats come out again and um, challenge you if you have you know the obvious odd idea in your project proposal so yep Right. Yeah, we're small enough here, so yeah. No, no. But that brings us back to the idea that some of those aspects are actually relevant for your group work here, right? When you actually preparing your submission in the end, particularly the document section will be relevant for you uh, for your group work. So, but not as literal as, uh, yeah, not not literal as Simon ju just suggested. Any? No. Okay. Cool. So, um, so how do you facilitate a um, interaction in a group without any, you know, while avoiding conflicts? And there are general strategies, right? The um, Obvious one is to have a some sort of a tone of objectivity, right? So how would you get an objective uh, environment? You know, how do you uh, choose wording carefully so that you are working uh, objectively as opposed to subjectively? Any idea or personalized? How would you do that? It's not really helpful here, right? So there's not much uh, concrete example. So how do you do it in your everyday life? Sorry? Yes, I'm um, uh, wondering how would you frame um, in your team environment, right? So you're unhappy with a particular idea. How would you objectify it uh, and not make the person that suggested the idea make res uh, responsible or blamed or somewhat for the idea? Sorry? Right. 
Right. Yeah. So yeah, either well, in worst case, bring it back to yourself, but focus on the what? Can you just? Yes, focus on the idea, right? So critique the idea or the thing, you know? Or um, you could collectivize it as well, right? We should have thought about this better or something like this, right? Or this, I um, um, this idea is good, but I have another uh, alternative route. So you basically remove the, uh, the, the, the edge of the potential or risk of potential arguments, yep. So I, I guess it really depends on personality in particular as well, right? How personal you are. Some I think some individuals are really easy. Apparently, um, um, you know, some e um, people don't take any sort of criticism personally anyway in their professional role. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, but this would afford considerable development, right? So you have sunk costs already because we need to actually implement the whole idea before actually weeding it out in the beginning, right? So, I mean, yeah, in the later stage, totally right, right? So if you have a game prototype, you do some sort of A-B testing and so on, you, know, you have a group that uses that feature and another player group that doesn't have that particular feature to figure out, you know, what's the response, uh, you know, what's the experience of the individuals. But sometimes you just need to do it, you know, uh, orally because you won't have really something meaningful on, 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 on in code yet, you put it this way. Perhaps on paper, but perhaps not in code. But I agree, sure. It's a lot easier once you're at that stage. But then I think the adjustments are very minor that you can make, right? So if, you, if your game is pretty much implemented, how much uh, redevelopment can you really afford as a company, right? So because at that time, the vision kind of needs to, be, uh, needs to sit already, right? But this brings me to the next point, obviously, persistence, writing things down. Why? Why do we write things down? Yep. Yep. To remember? Yep. Um, and that is fairly true for pretty much, again, all projects, uh, because if, if you have been in as part of a member of an organization or in a, a member of a faculty, for example, um, if you have to make a decision in a team and half a year down the road you want to recall that decision, most likely the perception of that decision may or may not have changed unless you have minutes of that very meeting. So you need to write it down to actually have some sort of you know, ground truth that you can actually refer to, right? So, and that's very much the, I s would uh, suppose that it's very much the, ga the, the same for game developers. Once you're in the individual niche as a designer, artist, and so on, and you come back to the round table, your conception may have slightly shifted, right? We have a very subjective conception of memory as human beings, so it's very important to write things down so we're very clear what the decisions were, uh, who, wh who were the individuals involved, and what were the plans for the future, so you can actually have some sort of notion of uh, 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 tracking down um, problems uh, quite early, but also have some sort of responsibility involved. Obviously, the usual stuff, you want to make people comfortable, right? So we chose this auditum, uh, auditorium here to make you reasonably comfortable, right? And it's perfectly suited for group work, apparently, because you're <laughs> so everyone is totally comfortable. And I'm totally comfortable as well that you're all facing me directly. So um, no, but obviously, obviously it depends on the context, right? If you work in a, a team of six, you better sit in a you know environment that suits that one, in or in a Google style environment where you have you know uh, uh, um, futsal and so on. So, um, but it's important that everyone feels somewhat safe, right? Emotionally can express the ideas is not sub subjective individually. So therefore, we do the obje objectified communication. Uh, and obviously a physical space needs to meet the uh, uh, requirements that we have. It's quite easy to play objective but not be objective. So um, my wife also always tells me actions are louder than words. So because even though I may be committing to actually doing uh, washing up the dishes, I may just roll my eyes and feel realize, oh really, do I need to do it now? Can I, can't I do it tomorrow morning because I'm currently busy answering a very important email, you know, or uh, preparing the next lecture, but now it needs to happen now. So, and this is where actually my seeming commitment suggests, you know, more than my actions uh, that, that I convey. So rolling my eyes is probably not a good idea. In fact, um, this is, in the previous institution I've if you roll your eyes, it's considered a mild form of bullying already. <laughs> so. A microaggression. A that's, that's a good term to add. That said, I was talking to another, to another lecturer in that respect, and uh, he was saying, well, he was in the U.S. military before, uh, particularly in the Air Force. And he said, if you're not bullied, that's bullying, right? So only if, if you're subjected by someone else, you're actually respected in your community. 
So if people don't pay attention of you, that's real bullying in the military. So anyway, I don't want to push it too far here. Um, the anecdote is not helping. Um, but the point is, be polite and be respectful and be honest about it, right? So, I mean, like, commit to the fact that everyone has to say and contribute something. Um, but um, I, I think you don't need too much training on that one. As far as I understand, uh, the culture is very nice and uh, inclusive. But that's amongst the respect thing, right? Yes. So. I had no idea. I was just wondering about the um, division of hearing. If you stop speaking, <laughs> that means someone else will start speaking. I think you indicate that if I've given up the chair and now it's your turn, so you say I've stopped actively speaking, which means that you hear it. You hear a lot of people going, ah, ah, at the end of what they're saying, because they want to hold conversational um, tokens, right? They want to say, Rules. Yeah. I took a shortcut then, that's good, yes. So thanks to you, because I would have interrupted as well, I suspect. Yeah, um, cool. Um, obviously, be honest uh, goes along uh, well with this one, right? So you want to ex express your honest opinion, because it's uh, for the better of the you know game, the object you're actually doing, right? The cat. Knowing that the cat is in the cat role, you want to be honest about what you think without personalizing it. So that's feasible. That's those trade-offs can be met uh, quite well. Another aspect is uh, different personalities. So um, <coughs> by trade, I would consider myself pretty much an introvert, whereas other ones are a bit more of an extrovert. And I, th I favor one-to-one uh, -one communication over uh, open group communication, for example. Right? It's a lot, lot easier to um, for me to to have a sense of the understanding of the other person. But I think also more more um, trust conveying uh, complex concepts and so on. So it really depends um, on individuals or honest opinions sometimes as well. So it really depends on your team. If you're managing a larger team, if you're in that role, again, whether application developer or game developer doesn't matter at all, um, figure out how different people work. And many of developers are actually heavily introverts and actually needs a bit more you know, individual hand-holding than uh, in, in other disciplines, let's say, probably marketing, which is a bit more verbose and outspoken by definition. Cool. Um, so again, the idea is to um, <coughs> maintain, even though it's easy to break out into individual groups and subgroups, to maintain the cohesion unity of the team. Again, who and which animal is responsible for that one, or which role? Or roles? Let's make it plural. Which animal is probably the dominant figure in many maintaining the cohesion of the group? What's that? Okay, another? Yep, cool, why? Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's but probably both of them, right? So the bear's providing a shared vision, and the wolf is actually assuring that everyone is comfortable with this, right? The bear may just storm ahead as, as a leader and say, you know, push I its vision through, and nobody really uh, controls it. So again, the wolf role is quite important here. Yes, exactly. Cool. Right. Cool. Um, yeah, so those are a summary of those points. They're all made in the book as well, so if you uh, got lost about it, but they have some overlapping, but they are discrete in themselves, um, then you can easily uh, review those easily, um, uh, quite straightforward. Um, but again, the deepest theming is um, the, the idea that you really need to know what you're working for. You need to keep your aim in mind, your goal in mind, and that's where memory and communication is the key thing. Is this what I'm doing worth my time or, um, you know, can it satisfy the objectives that I have? For example, profit, right? So if you're wasting time uh, mucking around with the um, versioning of the configuration files in your game and actually not spending the time on uh, having um, nice, proper anima uh, animations uh, wedged out or you do some premature optimization of performance which is probably only played by 5% of all the players in the first place, then it's probably perhaps not worth your time or worth 
the team's time, in fact, because you're a member of a team, you need to think bigger picture. What is my uh, role in this, uh, in, 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 in as part of this game? So you always need to think, step back, some, not all the time, obviously, because then you're wasting more time questioning yourself than actually doing something. Uh, but from time to time, it's important to step back. What am I doing here? Is it the right thing? Right? So does it align with the uh, group and long-term objectives? Um, so um, some of the aspects that are a bit more, let's say, operative or infrastructural, obviously the idea how we interact. Yeah? So documents are a form of communication, right? So we write things down, it's asynchronous, we can store it somewhere, dig it out half a year later and realize we, uh, you know, we have a totally different vision now than we had half a year ago. Um, but still, it's communication, right? So, um, by the way, what's the most reliable form of communication, long-term communication? Which medium would you suggest for long-term communication? Yep. Uh, think about medium. So wha what's the classical medium for a document? Cool. So what's another medium that may be a bit more durable? Has worked quite well. What's the medium for video conference? That's. Okay, that's a digital format, right? So we agree on this. Another format. They think outside the digital box. There's a lot of empirical research, and we probably need to convey it here as well. Should be aware of what's the best medium for long-term storage or information. Yep. Physical, let's get better. More concrete. Literally more concrete. Sorry? Books and has this paper thing, right? So, yeah, and paper acid and all that kind of decay. <sighs> there you go. Yeah, it's rocks. Yeah? So, stone is still the best communication medium for long term preservation of information. Something to bear in mind. We always think we're speeding ahead and have you know, new means and uh, ways of storing and maintaining information. But ultimately, we're actually in a very volatile state with our digital information because you don't even know if your photo collection exists you know, 10 years from now, perhaps not to a lifetime of your children. Sorry? Flash drive. Oh, okay. Uh, 100,000 cycles. Mm. Mm. Yes. Oh no, obviously other channels. That's anyway sidetracking a bit. But the idea is sometimes you need to think about what's what what do I preserve for how long and so on. And then digital may not always be the optimal solution. So um cool. So obviously other means of in, uh, communication is emails, SMS, and there is obviously the pattern of talking one to one and one to many, right? So documents are good for distribution uh, am amongst many, whereas probably a uh, classical telephone call uh, may involve the interaction between do I two individuals and not necessarily a shared conversation. That's quite important. But another communication tool that is important for all of you guys uh, programming tools, right? So, and I think we listed most of them here already. Um, so, obviously, it's uh, coding conventions, so it's part of the reason we're actually learning them. Why, why is uh, coding conventions relevant? Why is it, can you consider it a tool of uh, communication? Yeah, right, right. So if you know the specification, you know that, well, if you're working at Google and you're writing Java code, you know exactly that you need to use the Google specs of Java documentation, oh, sorry, for, for uh, Java code, and you'll be fine. Exactly. Yeah, what was your point? So, yeah, no. Yep, yep, so, yep. Yep. No, no, you're, you're right. So uh, oftentimes companies or the houses you're working in, the shops, uh, dev shops, they will have uh, individualized conventions for coding, right? So for particular languages, obviously. Sometimes they're also encoded in language. What's the language that's um, very particular about formatting? You should have, could have seen that already? No? Okay. No, Python-ish? No, yes, perhaps? Yeah, that, yeah. Exactly, right? Particular Python 3, I think, right? Python 2 was forgiving on tabs, right? Isn't it? 
So, yeah, anyway, so it's a form of communication because you can ensure that somebody else looking at your code can actually read it, can concentrate on the meta, not the medium, right? So not necessarily the code you're using to uh, uh, um, uh, define it, yeah? What's another important aspect of uh, encoding that you need to think about, apart from just shared conventions, coding conventions? I will come to you. No? Perhaps you? No? Anyone? What's important? Apart from the classic commenting. commenting, right? Documentation, commenting, obviously, is quite important as well, right? So, if you, I mean, uh, how many of you actually have your own, have written your own pet project, your own code snippet? Yeah, cool, one, two, three. So, yeah, one third of you guys, cool. Did you ever, you know, save your program and come came back to it half a year later and try to understand what you actually wrote? wrote? Did you have trouble doing that? Yes, right? So as, as soon as it gets somewhat involved, you better to do some sort of documenting, right? And it may just be for your own sake, but documentation actually makes a hell of a difference. So it's a form of communication, right? Programming itself. <coughs> and, uh, you know, aspects such as collaborative editing, it's about the meta. So if you sit together, actually review code collectively. So it's about talking about something else, but actually collaborating, communicating ideas, but also skills, right? So if you're doing code review with someone who's way better than you in coding, then that's a reality we just need to face. I mean, you know, the, the, there's always a discrepancy in skill set in particular areas. It's always good with to sit together with somebody better, go, somebody better go over the code and learn from him, right? The way he or she attacks the particular uh, problem. And obviously, the direct uh, form of that is pair programming, you know, where you sit in pairs and actually program at the same time, or not really at the same time, but uh, having constant review and iterate between programming and review um, amongst two individuals. So different, different forms. <coughs> cool. Um, anything else I want to say here? Um, no, I think it should be reasonably clear. We talk a bit about version control later because of the concept that you have heard about already. Yes, no, perhaps? Yeah, you use it, but individually, right? So not as part of a course? Cool. Cool, sweet. So again, I'm just bringing up the team roles here because they actually correspond to many of the functions or the, uh, the ideas there in that uh, in um, communication mechanisms, but also the way um, uh, the teams are actually functioning and working, right? So what we talked about it enough, I guess. I think everyone gets the intuition. You can look it up if you're still not sure yet, but you will be very sure about it. Um, quite soon, at least once the um, due date comes closer of your particular assignment. Cool. Uh, shall we take a break here? Is that a good time? Yeah, so I think it's an appropriate time to take a break. Let's be back in 10 minutes. Reasonable? Ten? Yeah, 20 past, please. Cool. Thank you.
Um, are, you, are you talking? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Nice. I posted the read more button somewhere, so but no, thank you for your for your insight. But on that notice, uh, on that note rather, um just following up on Amisi's uh, talk, <coughs> in fact there's the notion of five whys, right? Is that taught somewhere here? No, yes, perhaps. So the idea is um there was the idea of reasoning. And um you can apply that quite practically because uh, generally any opinion is usually based by some sort of statement, right? So, um, if you if you say that um, twelve year olds like like Barbie games, right? So your question, the next question should be why, and it needs to be substantiated with some sort of fact, right? I don't know be because uh, they like to play with the same object in the physical environment, and then you can backtrack further and ask again, why do they do this? And they do that for five iterations, and then usually you have a reasonably sound. What is that? Five. One, two, three, four, one more. Then you will have a reason, if you are able to answer this one, you have a reasonable sound argumentation tree that you can use then and actually argue, okay, it actually makes sense. But bear in mind that this tree can span out because you may have more than one answer to a particular why question you may ask be asking, right? But it's a possibly a discussion tool you can bring along because an opinion is often not enough. You want to have some sort of factual backing, ideally really factual backing, but if it's intuitive, you know, it, it can actually uh, it can work as well. But it should never a decision should never be reduced to an opinion of an individual member of a group. I think that's roughly what you want to what to con convey, right? So cool. Right, yes. 
So cool. Before diving deeper, deeper into this, but I had to just follow up since it's uh, just so um, contemporary. Um, regarding groups, so uh, the members of group three, could you just stand up? Just to identify all of you, because we're still having group membership issues. That is a very big group. Are you group three? Think so. Okay. Okay. Is anyone? Does anyone else think so that he is part of group three? No. So, but you had more members, right? I suspect. So you are in one group, which is cool. So because eventually your group has at least two members now. Cool. Uh, Before, okay, right, uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's why, that's why, that's why the question in the first place. But it's good to bring you guys together. So, but uh, you guys, you know, eventually should share your context so you can actually t uh, form up. That was part number one. Second number, uh, quite a number of people are not grouped yet, right? Because either they work remotely or haven't been there on Friday or whatever other reasons doesn't matter. Point there being, um, at the end of the lecture, in fact, before the end of the lecture, I will. Uh, you know, um, let you go and you could just um, or collectively go to Simon's office and you will sort it out there, right? So assign you individual roles, assign you to groups. Um, so um, this his office is in A213, so it's the second floor staff area um, uh, of the A building over there and you can just talk to him and then basically he will uh, allocate you to particular groups, right? Who, how many of you are not allocated yet explicitly to groups? Just to get a feel, cool, that's oh wow, that's at least two groups already. Yeah, good, it's for eight to ten people. Sweet, okay. Um, so I, it's it probably, if, if I don't mention it, it's probably the time when I uh, ask you guys to do, uh, to continue working on your group exercise. That's a good time for you to just venture over. We try to be there soon. Uh, as uh, possible because I don't want to waste your time too much here. So even though I enjoy it. Um, so, um, all right, let's continue. So coming back to the idea. So today's we're talking about teams, we're talking about documents, but we didn't really talk about, uh, apart from the abstract group membership that we have here with our uh, stereotypes, um, the members of a game development team. What are those? What are the roles uh, as part of a game dev um, company? Which roles do you know about? Just for everyone... A sense, a subtle, 3D modeling, right? So 3D modeling. So wh what would you allocate them under? What would a bigger picture? What would uh, who is doing the 3D modeling? Artists, yeah. So if artists, so let's stay on that higher level. Yep. Marketing team, cool, cool, cool. Let's see if I have. Bear with my handwriting. That's an interesting one. Okay. Artists. Marketing. What else? <laughs> yeah, developer. Yeah. Cool. Who else? Management. What do they do? Okay. Yeah. So I do all that secondary stuff, right? Like finance, human resources, just say HR briefly, any other thing? Oh, sorry. Lead designers, um, lead designers. Um, yeah, give me an example. Okay. I just want to separate it from the artists a bit. Okay. So you think about storyline, things like that? Is that oh right, okay. Yep. So let's call them kind of game designer perhaps. Is that okay? Right, and you know. Yeah, producer, let's put them there. I mean there's always an overlap, you know, it's like um there should be it's not hard and fast the rules here. Producers. So we having a good set already. Who else? There's more people that... So community manager, what is that? Which... So which, which area would that be? 
marketing. Was one probably that right? Outreach kind of thing. So often yeah, that's good. That's good. Yes. Security, security, yeah, that's a tough one. So it's more like, okay, that kind, yeah, yeah, security is a valid point, absolutely. Wow, so many, okay. Let's go up the, yeah, sound engineers. Where do we do well, those ones? Kind of fit here, right, do they? No? More artists, yeah? Where then? Distinctively different. Okay, you want to have it dedicated in their own area. So voice people in as well. So okay, let's do it under. So what what should be the category? Engineer. Audio en yeah yeah. Yeah, well, uh, briefly, audio, probably engineer involved as well. Yes, any any other views, opinions? Tester, yeah. Which of those guys could be among the tester group? To some extent, developers, right? But it's always not a hard and fast rule. It depends on the size of your shop. If you're doing your own one-man show, then you probably do all of those tasks. Still an idea, yeah? Animators, yes, animators. Pff. Yeah, they can be. Which could be? Which area could they be subsumed in? Still put them out there. Yep, artists. Yes, agreed. Feel free to disagree. I put them out here anyway, because it's an important point. So they link to artists somewhat, right? So there's a large uh, large number of different roles um, that can actually be played in the, um, well, they need to be played. So, and it's actually kind of similar for application development as well. Obviously, we focus on games here, but all the aspects to varying extents are important in the uh, area of game uh, development there um, as well. Um, so that was the list that um, we had already, so and uh, it captures many of the aspects. I think developers and software engineers somewhat fits. You're right, artists and sound engineers are two distinctively different roles, so that's good. Producers, yep, we need them, game designers, and the marketing people, obviously, as well. So you have a good intuitive understanding who's actually involved in that role. Um, what does the producer do? Cool. Okay. One with the money, yeah, very good point. So uh, they manage the pot of money. It doesn't mean they own it, but they manage it, yes. Any, no, cool. Yeah, so those are important points. Obviously, it's about this one. Um, we talked before that there was some, some uh, point about um, looking at HR as well, which is an important aspect. Actually, assembling, maintaining teams as well. If the team fails, it's usually a producer's issue, right? So producer's fault, your manager's fault, as in any um, other employment relationship as well. So your manager needs to manage the team in the first place uh, because even the team can uh, dis be dysfunctional if the bear in his role doesn't do its job um, properly. Cool. So again, it's pricing, it's budgeting, uh, setting priorities, tasks and so on, is all that kind of stuff involved. Then we have uh, the artistic elements, which includes graphics, um, sounds, arts, sketches um, that you will need, um, character development, right? So um, uh, quite important over time, so how individual actually um, changes uh, in the course of the game and provide obviously environment as well, so meaning you have some sort of conceptual design of the game uh, as a whole um, that is integrated. But this is more along the storyline, um, let's say, yeah, really more on the artistic side of things, whereas it's clearly separated from the technical uh, implementation, which is generally done by some sort of uh, graphics team, right, that focuses on the how to realize the uh, visions that have been set out by the game designers explicitly. By the way, I note that a lot of people write down uh, notes, which is in principle a good idea. Uh, note that the slides are on Blackboard, right? So they will be in Blackboard. But if you have additional comments, obviously uh, go for it, please. I don't want to discourage that. Um, so graphics is really about realizing it in, in, in software, right? Making it available. Um, and if you... Yeah, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, 
and you obviously have some overarching uh, objectives, so the game must run well. So th this is probably more associated with the actual experiential point of view. So we have the designers that have their vision of the game. We have uh, the technologists or graphics people um, that are actually uh, implementing within the bounds of the available hardware and so on. And then the uh, game designers that will be uh, integrating that whole lot and, ho and ensure that there's a coherent experience. And those will be the guys that assessing as well and have some sort of oversight over the potential testing um, that is involved. Uh, be it, for example, by having actual users or uh, doing in-house testing, some sort of alpha level testing. Cool. So testing is quite straightforward. Which animal role would probably be associated with testing most accurately? Yeah, right. So same, I guess, right? The cat has this, this uh, risk avoidance factor and actually actively trying to break things to some extent. Not in a necessarily to destructive manner, but in a, a risk avoidance manner. So to ensure that the product would actually reach uh, the market. Um, overlapping with the idea of the game design is obviously marketing. They're focused on the outside outreach, right? So uh, the user communities, developing communities is possibly an issue. Having focus group, what are focus groups about? Anyone? Yes. Cool. So that's exactly what you said. Uh, just to read it briefly for the sake of uh, um, the, the audience. Um, so basically, it's a representative sample of a uh, demographic, right, of a society of the target audience uh, that you test the game on. It's a focus group. So they're external to the game development uh, itself, right? Um, something managed by them. Um, obviously, you can do classical empirical research into uh, in how far. Um, aspects of a game are appealing to um, the target audience in the first place. Sample testing, um, obviously somewhat similar. What's A-B testing? Anyone? Any ideas? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what do you think this is useful for, this tool, A-B testing? Or anyone, it's an open question. Well, I let you, uh, you guys. Yeah. So, in in the context of a team, what would be uh, what would be what uh, what would it be good for? What could it solve? Disagreements, right? So, you have multiple positions, and they're hardening over time. And at some stage, the, uh, the whole progress of the game is uh, challenged or you're wasting so much time in discussion, then you can just put, you know, have it, uh, two test groups and actually run that particular feature, perhaps even implement it, just to ensure that this roadblock is out of the way and development can go on, right? So it's actually a quite important feature, also from a team perspective. So it's not just, okay, here's the game and we're trying out some features, but actually for resolution of uh, uh, process issues uh, in your game, right? So uh, it's quite important. I think looking at this... Who, which which role was responsible for process in particular? The owl, right? The owl metaphor. Actually, if we waste too much time on things, we need to get stuff done. Then the owl can suggest those uh, uh, tools to intervene and actually uh, um, ensure progress. Any was there any other sort of? Okay, I'm just looking at the crowd of animated heads to figure out if there are some possible hands showing up because I don't want to have leave you out if in case you have something to contribute here. Cool. So. Um, you, so you notice that all those uh, individual roles kind of correspond to what you experience in your smaller group subsets, but now it should really sink in, I guess. Um, but some important notes here. Um, we strictly need to separate between the technical and conceptual development. Who is responsible for actually getting a game out to the market, managing the money, managing the team? And who is responsible for performing the actual technical contribution? Um, that's, that's the key, director, uh, key challenge that... Um, needs to be distinct, uh, um, distinctly managed. Like producer, uh, game marketing, as uh, marketing and game design uh, and artists are um, generally not involved, but they obviously rely on the uh, knowledge of the uh, technical team to actually indicate the limitations, right? The uh, possibilities, um, what you can do technically uh, given the platform, but the idea is that it's strictly separated. This is obviously an oversimplification, those few roles we just explored, because you came up with a lot more roles. If you think about deployment in particular, 
that's generally more like a DevOps kind of problem, right? So it's like people that uh, are actually um, worrying about or thinking about how to deploy your update most efficiently on Steam or the like that may not necessarily be developers, but actually a subset of them at the same time, how to manage security effectively and so on. Um, there's much more uh, individual roles that would be uh, involved. But looking at the big picture of game development, ultimately it's a business proposal, right? So the, the point is, you want to make profit or money in the long term, doesn't need to be immediately, doesn't need to be every game. In fact, it probably won't be every game, I'll get to that in a second, but you have some sort of uh, economic uh, uh, objective. So, um, who of you guys worked in a kind of game design environment or in a company that has developed games to some extent? Yeah, cool. So you have, uh, what's your, do you want to share some of your experience there? or? Ah, okay. Okay. Different, yeah. Oh, okay. That was fun doing it, yes. So uh, I assume, did you learn more technical things or more on the human side of things? Possibly, huh? So, yeah. So that's uh, I think that's that's the good. So you have a bit of a head start because that's precisely what happens in the first round that you kind of really figure out what goes wrong. The, we, we somebody mentioned scoping, which is really good. Figuring out teamwork, how to distribute teamwork best, and uh, you know ho hopefully to get your idea out and you got your idea out, which is good. Um, but uh, that may not even the be the case. So it's really a, a challenging environment. The question is really why you're in for it. You need to kind of know that for yourself. So knowing the people is important, obviously, that you want to have in your team. Do you know your budget? And do you have industry knowledge? doesn't help you much if you have a perfectly functioning team, a shared vision, good technologists among you, but no industry knowledge. You actually don't know what a particular target group actually wants, right? And this is kind of what this course is somewhat about, getting the concept of user-centered design, personas, and so on into you guys. So you later on, you can come back to that. Ah, hang on, didn't we talk about this in experience design when you actually start developing games or think about the process uh, in a wider sense? Um, for, for the ones of you that haven't had uh, experience in a game dev shop or in a company that did it, uh, a small YouTube video, see if that goes to give you an intuition of what the uh, involved aspects in becoming an indie developer could be. So I'm hoping that we have some sound. We do, hang on. It's not on the screen, I know, okay. but I just ch check the sound first. How to get that going. Do you know that thing? Yes, everyone knows that video already? No, don't, good. See if we hear anything. For the past few years, we've done a series of So uh, You Want to Be episodes. Got okay, okay. Some magic here. So now it's about intuitive user design. I'm not sure if they managed it here. Um, does anyone know how to increase the volume? Because there's no button here. Without a letter. Well, without sound, there's not much value to that thing. Um, what I can try is to bring it up on that. Still locked in. It's equally. Ha, huh, them. I don't think. Yeah, the. You mean the full fledged thing? Volume is yeah, break devices and two speakers. Okay, thank you. I just want to see the um, 
the level. Now we're not really lucky, I guess. Yeah. I guess there wouldn't be much value showing that video without um, too much. But I can give you some of the intuitions um, of it. Sorry for that. Once I figure that out. Um I would let you know. But anyway, the slide set is up on uh, Blackboard. You can run it for yourself. Uh, but basically, it talks about how the initial uh, round as an indie developer works. It's literally about getting everything wrong. Um, it's very unlikely that you're coming up with your own game company uh, and having the right, or worse, don't have a company, but have the right set of people and actually start developing something that actually has success, right? Most likely, you run into issues with uh, uh, human interaction teams. Uh, budgeting is a big one. And uh, one particular aspect is also uh, payment, right? So then you have a considerable investment um, to make before actually you before your game goes actually out and is actually available. And only very late, when once a potentially publishing studio has made some return, you actually see some of your money. So even bridging that one can actually make you bankrupt as a, a small game dev studio. So the lesson learned there being is, for the first round, it's really about trying it out, number one. Number two, gaining visibility. And uh, number three, uh, actually managing finances, getting a feel of how much money you actually need to develop a game and sustain your um, cooperation. So it's not a, not a really primitive task. And the question is there if you are really keen still um, if you're still keen on actually doing this. And to do that, you definitely need to answer, uh, answer at least some of those questions. And again, the five whys will help you as well here. So where does the money actually sit in your game business model, right? Where do you spend the most money? Is it on the artists or is it on, on uh, developing or is it marketing? Marketing is a big one. So something like developing of communities. Sometimes you have this hype effect that communities around the game are developed before the actual game is released, right? So, so people get hyped up and get interested and most likely become biased. But it may also mean that you sink considerable cost here without with an unknown uh, return on your investment. So it's a risk as well. But something more concrete is, uh, for example, getting an estimate of how much you actually sell. Again, a marketing task, but you need to figure out what is the buying power of the potential car target group and how much of a niche do you actually occupy with your game. Right? If you just follow the mainstream and you um, develop the next Angry, Gerd, uh, Angry Bird game or whatever it will be, you're most likely not having a ma big market traction. Your death cost will be relatively low, possibly, and, uh, but it will be very hard to push it to a market to have a reasonable success, I guess. So uh, it really boils down to uh, knowing your market enough and then getting a good estimate um, and figuring out how much you actually need to sell before you break even, before you actually make any profit. And a um, small um, scenario that highlights that a bit is um, developing a mobile game, right? Assuming you develop a mobile game, it sells for two US dollars on um, in any of the um, app markets, assuming in this case is uh, Apple. And um, so you probably would end up having roughly 40,000 US dollars, which amounts to, um, um, yeah, so basically the, the number of games that you sold. But again, Apple takes considerable a fraction of that one simply by hosting it. So meaning that's part of your deployment problem solved for a considerable price. So one third of your uh, returns go to Apple directly. And that leaves you roughly with uh, 27,000 or 28,000 US dollars, which corresponds to um, roughly 240,000 kroner. Um, so that's not a massive amount of money, especially if you have three people working on it full time, um, developing that game. If you, um, assuming that individuals have an annual salary of 300,000 K, um, which is kind of low, I guess, right? So it would be on the lower end, I suspect, for game developers here, uh, rather. And um, you have three people doing this, you probably have like three months to develop the game. And that is, just to break even without considering any costs that you might have, right? Any fixed costs, such as, you know, working environment, power, internet, uh, infrastructure in the widest sense, um, advertising um, for, your, for, your, for your studio as opposed to a particular game, um, potential litigation issues with accountants and lawyers and so on. So there's probably not really much, uh, much left at the end of the border, uh, at the, uh, you know, below the balance line, really. So you need to be really mindful. Um, or really be aware about the objective of your game. Do you just want to gain visibility or do you want to really make a dent? And also the money you actually sit behind it. 
you have sitting behind you. Also note that the money doesn't come in immediately. It really depends when your b game is actually bought. So you need to bridge that time, right? But yet you need to pay your developers probably during those initial three months, right? So I mean, so it's uh, kind of a challenging thing. Obviously, what's mildly um, moderating the idea is that you have kind of a pipeline of games. Obviously, those people would shift around um, and possibly move to next to the next game. So you need to think about uh, succession what's coming next, right? Do I just uh, plan another release of the same game, different uh, uh, iteration, or do we try out an entire new new concept and how much overlap, how much pipelining do I need to do, right? So, um, so question is there, are you in for the love or the money, right? It's particular game development. Application development is a quite different story. In fact, that is probably a more realistic story in the, in the long term. It's the customers are usually well known, the demand is quite straightforward, and um, your project has a much longer lifespan, right? Software um, would be, would be um, deployed in cycles of three to five years, roughly, at least traditionally. Nowadays, it's a bit more obscured because we have this pay-per-use model where everything is sitting in the cloud and you basically use software or pay based on demand. Um, but the, um, the lifetime of software is generally much longer than of games, right? So what's, what's the actual average lifetime of a game? You guys may know that better than I do. Sorry? Half-Life, yes, 98, yes, okay. Is it still uh, played, the old one? But only uh, by a kind of a subculture community, right? So, right. But if you think about the mainstream, the real, um, I agree, I agree. You obviously have those long, long-term uh, um, um, projects, yeah. Yeah, Counter Strike is a good example. Yep. So, yeah. Yes, right, so it will be decaying profit because most likely you're not seeing much of that or it will be cho uh, sold very cheaply. Please. Yeah. I see what you mean, but I'm more thinking about what's the you know the uh, return cycle. I mean, yeah, sure, you will always have those few people that actually still buy uh, a game after years, but the main uh, hype of the game is probably not that long-lasting, right? So, I mean, would you would you argue that a game lasts more than two years in terms of its um, at, at, at its peak, or possibly not, right? What's your view? Exactly. We're talking weeks, right? So we're not talking years at all. We're talking weeks. And then, yes, you ha may have a community. A community you may have either um, uh, has been built by fans themselves or by heavy investment using marketing, right? So you actually develop an online community and people buy into it and suddenly that game seemingly stays alive. But at some stage, you realize that companies switch off their services because it doesn't make sense anymore. The income is too moderate um, to, to warrant Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So that's, yeah, but that is a cash cow kind of thing, but it's obviously not giving you um, a massive income anymore. Yeah, you're right. There are various business models in that area that actually um, spin off uh, into the same direction. Sometimes I uh, realize more and more it's also a um, giving the players goodies. For example, releasing old games for free in order to hype or, you know, re. Reinvigor reinvigorate that community to buy the next version of that game. So that uh, happened. I think Command Conquer, the series, was largely uh, handed out for free eventually. Yep. 
Yes, you, if you have sunk costs in your community, yep. S that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very absolutely valid point. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. Yes. So it's a lot. Of those those series have come up with an entire new model. Like Need for Speed is similar as well, I think. Right. So it's also one of those long-lasting titles. FIFA, obviously, and all the game uh, variants as well. But uh, Total War is a good one. Yeah. Mm? Right. Yep. Mm. So this is. Yeah. 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 Cool. So it's uh, like in this add-on add-on model, what's quite popular. And that's a very good point. Yes. Uh, so it's a bit of a tough one uh, making that call. But you know the the. the op the titles you highlighted right now are really the more popular ones, right? So you as a small indie developer, you will kind of struggle to keeping that hype alive, yeah, particularly because the co unless you have a really strong community behind you that is really forgiving about you, know, you taking your time or having your lapses in uh, 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 momentary lapses of reason uh, when you develop a game. But um, it's obviously way easier to keep this hype going for larger companies like uh, EA uh, or the like, yes. Sweet. Um, something that I think fits quite well is the um, idea, I talked, to, uh, talked about this in the very beginning, is the idea of pitching a game. If you think about a game concept, when you think about your rules, um, it's generally about getting the money. So uh, unless you really are uh, invested into your game, you have the money all the time. In fact, time is money in that respect. Um, then you can start developing a game, sure. But realistically, you need to pitch it to someone and ask for money from investors, right? It's not something that you're actually dealing with yourself um, or that you are actually having yourself, but you need to source it somehow. So um, in this context, there's the concept um, of uh, pitching. Did anyone of, here you, he of you hear about the elevator pitch, the idea of that? Yes, I see some happy many times. Yes, cool. Cool. Does everyone know that elevator pitch? Is it a common? Yes, no, yes, no. Okay. Do you would you would you wish to elaborate briefly? Get an idea. Yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So um in in uh, in that that's yeah it's pretty much summing it up the key thing is about being very concise in your delivery and very focused the metaphor i heard was that you're able to deliver it doing an elevator ride from bottom to top so you're standing to next to the ceo which you didn't really bargain to have the opportunity to do but you need to be able to convey your story in that line so you need to have your story straight you need to get out your facts right and your uh, core points of your of your project right so something very important that will probably a challenge will be a challenge that w uh, some of you will face apparently very often in the area of web development um, and some of the aspects uh, highlighted here just for you to reflect on um, uh, those ones so you obviously get into the door show that you're kind of serious about it you need to be committed professional I guess including attire but also behavior and um, well that's the thing about the love lens again you need to be passionate about what you're doing I guess right to, to, to actually sell the idea that you're into the product you want to sell, right? So it's not just for the money. You kind of need to do a lot actually to, to gain the attraction and not just um, uh, use words, but also actions to show that. Obviously confidence is important, uh, but uh, more than that, I think it's always important to think about what other people think about your idea. So not necessarily about you as a person, but about your concept. How would they attack it to preempt potential cats in the room, right? So what are critique points that you obviously don't mention initially, but that you need to be able to respond to, right? What are the shortcomings of your game? 
what are the questions they may ask, how many units do you expect to sell, what is your target audience and so on, right? So those kind of uh, thoughts that you would want to bring. Um, and obviously you need to systematically design it, but I think it's a bit of something you do by experience, I suspect, right? So once you did it a few times, you have your kind of rule set, you know, and then you probably convey it uh, quite straightforward, but it's something that's uh, quite important. Important aspect, just to highlight it from, from a gaming perspective, very particular to gaming, is um, how do you design your game, you know, how many me levels, characteristics, multiplayer games, um, perhaps even uh, kind of delineate uh, the core I don't want to use the term genre again. Um, you know, the, the 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 target platforms, for example, uh, for example, that are relevant for uh, your game. Then more managerial aspects such as scheduling. So, how long will it take to build it, to deploy it, and actually to sell it? So, when do you see actual return? And um, obviously, costs and the risks again. The risks is obviously a key thing that uh, money give us. Um, or the, the funders generally look at um, in how far you can actually prevent risks or minimize risks or um, find other alternative solutions. So um, that's a bit of a daring one. So I talked about the third years giving a pitch, um, but it perhaps it would be an interesting angle for you guys to give a pitch as well. Um, so the conception here, it looks a bit scary in that respect, but you're currently working on your game project. and. I would have hoped, that's why my early questioning, that there are still some alternative viewpoints or, you know, not conflicts, but uh, different perspectives on what rules you want to change in your respective games, right? In your card games or board games or the like. And I wonder if you could split your teams into groups of three each and pitch your, or, or sorry, of, 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 of individuals that favor a particular rule that you want to introduce in the game and the other group concentrates on another rule that you want to introduce of into the game and pitch it to each other. So just to try out the uh, particular um, characteristics. Obviously, it will be a bit far-fetched to go as far to say as to say you know the financial details, but you may uh, know about the publicity or the uh, visibility of your particular game. So it may actually be quite feasible to do that. Um, but this would be one way uh, of thinking about what are the shortcomings of uh, your particular ideas. So I would give you probably um, ah, 10 minutes is more than enough for that. Um, give you um, roughly 10 minutes and um, do it amongst your small groups. Obviously, it's a bit hard for the ones that haven't had any group assignment yet, which is a tad unfair. Um, but who, which groups are somewhat grouped together already? Ah, cool. Okay, one group. Cool. How exciting. Um, so, which group knows about each other? Okay. Yeah, there's some group that still know their group members. That's pretty cool. Um, okay. Is any okay? What what I want to suggest is the following. So, um, I want you guys to pitch it against each other, but I also want to know if anyone is keen to present it to everyone. Uh, to pitch your game and your rule set, you what you're proposing uh, in in you know to everyone in that audience right now. Is anyone keen doing that? I will give you ten minutes to prepare and you go for it. I mean, you can't lose anyway. No. Sorry. Valid point. There you go. That's the yeah yeah intellectual property. Yeah, it's a valid concern. You need to consult your lawyers first before you can do that. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Cool, but um, yeah, and, um, I would I would encourage you anyway to to take those ten minutes and or a few minutes and think about how you'd pitch your particular game or rule set against someone else, right? So um, I hope you would be able to team up with your respective uh, groups. If not, well, then just make it a, a paper exercise for now. Yeah. So we'll continue at I continue at roughly quarter past there. You can do it anyway, outside, inside, and so on. And if anyone decides for whatever reason to actually present it, I'm really Encouraging it. Probably should have brought chocolate or something. So anyway. Ja, gemerkt.
Okay, so who actually did the pitching exercise and who had a break? Honesty was one of the communication principles. Okay, some pitching there. Is anyone keen trying it out in front of a class? Yeah? You going for it? Cool. Cool, amazing. Well, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Hold this. Working? Thanks. Yeah, my group pitched uh, the game called War, eller på norsk krig, and uh, we thought it was an interesting idea. And um, the problem was the total game is just pure random and pure chance. And uh, we all played this as a kid, and we thought just to change the childhood game to make it more fun. So we tried to each rule to take the chance out of it, to make it more tactical. So um, first was to make uh, well, what is the fun of the game is, is war. We want more war, and then increase the risk and the chance. And when you win, you have feel that you won the war. So we want to increase the chance. So we changed that it didn't meet to the same. Uh, number corner nine nines, just the color. If it was red and red, then it was a war. And that actually increased the war and actually we made like five, like in the beginning of the game it was like five wars. And then again and again. So it, it makes it more tense, more fast and all that. So we tried to intense, but uh, it ended up, the game was too quick and it was also more and more war. So it wasn't uh, that fun. So we changed more that um, we had uh, to like type of card, a heart against heart. A spade against spade, and that made it also more more war, but less. But the same comes it was this more war, more intense. Um, but still, this th there was still this element of a chance. If, if it's the same heart, then you won. So then we made it more tactical that you have three cards. Like you draw three cards from your deck, put it in front of you, and then you play a card, and then you can choose if you want to use your cards on your hand to initiate a war, um, to win the war or something like that. So it makes like, you can think, then you see what card he has, and then you could put it into a tactical event. Um, that was just basically what, we, what the ideas we come up with. Um, we are like, we're trying to make more. We pitched, I pitched uh, one outside right now, just came up with it randomly, that uh, whether we war, we put one card, and then we put three cards down. And then from the next one, we put two cards, and the combination of the spoon wins the war. If it's, if it's equal, when we, then we put three more cards, and then we use three cards in total. It increases the chance and um, and the risk and all that, and makes it just more fun. Uh, yeah, that's just basically the pitch of war and the rules we had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Any questions? Problems of the game? No? Perf perfect game? 10 out of 10? <laughs> <laughs> My own group member. Try I don't know. <laughs> Trying to. Trying to destroy a childhood memory. Huh. Um, yeah. I don't know. Well, well, we're not kids anymore, so we have the the concept out of what is fun is different. So, as kids, just any game in total, we actually we made games all the time. Everything should be a game. Everything should be fun. So in the war, even though it's so simple, we had so much fun. And now when we're adults. Our concept, what is fun, what we think is fun, what uh, makes it fun with each other changes, and the game that's simple for us adults, so we need to change it so the adults can also have fun with it. Yes?
right, to build on that. Like my rules of war are different from the, like the Norwegian ones. I built, I, uh, I played with the Icelandic ones, and when I see the Norwegian ones, I couldn't understand it at first. But uh, I played with it, so it's a different kind while we wa played it. And uh, yeah, and uh, it was kind of funny when we were pitching ideas. I had like the Wikipedia page up, and there were already a lot of different versions of war. And it was funny when every time they pitched it, it was already been made. <laughs> So everything that made pitch, I was like, ah, no, it's all been made. So we just all ideas were scratched out because it's all been made. And I uh, saw a hand raised. Yeah, you. Well, basically, it's, it's just m it it is mind numbing. It's just you're so bored. Oh, I got just put a card. Just you just you don't even think. You just put a card in one. What's that? But like, if you want to play with the numbers, you do. It's more like if you so just um, make something that is that simple and try to make complicated. Maybe make it more fun. Maybe it create a new game, basically. So uh, you can play some rules with just giving a different taste or put a twist to it that could. Uh, maybe you want to play something you don't want to play the same thing again and again and again and go into a sanity so uh, just changing the rules so it it more intense maybe something new and all that anyone else? yes, you? yeah That's uh, that's one of the problems of too many wars that it was just spawning. That's why we, um, at the same time, when we initiate many wars, we have to up the risk. So when there's a war, it like uh, like you this pot. That's why I came with the rules having two cards and then three cards and then equal and put more cards on the table. Uh, so it up the risk when there was so many wars. And then we trying to turn it down like okay, maybe not the different kind. So we trying to change so. Uh, the wars wouldn't be like frequently, but more than normal. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brave, very brave. Yes. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. So we we'll probably hear more about this once you're done with your final version. Uh, but at least he did some initial user checking already. So. Not really a focal focal group, but uh, quite a big focus group, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sounds like an interesting approach. Yeah, cool. So, but I think bear in mind, even for your own uh, groups, or you could even pitch it to other groups, and ideally groups that actually don't have the same game. So I heard already intellectual property, who they're stealing my rules. But if you're pitching, you're playing a different game, board game versus role playing game, and so on, it's easy to you know just present to each other as well. Think about this. Um, as an idea. Obviously, you know, you can't do it con to the constraints. We're not so much talking about financial constraints here, so it's a bit of a different um, egg here. Okay, so um, final thing, documentation. We talked about teams and documents as part of that kind of weirdly interlinked lecture here, but um, documentation is obviously very uh, important. I just briefly want to not only talk about the content of documentation, because it's something you can get from the slides in case we run out of time, but rather about document management, which is probably more important. And it's f at least for everyone who's so doing some sort of coding. Yeah. So I mean, in, bas in fact, I as soon as you create a digital artifact, you want to think about uh, um, this in your in context of your um, work. So first the management, and then we talk about game design documents in more particular. So. Does anyone know about, uh, of you already know about a uh, versioning system or software versioning, the idea? Yes? Cool. Privately or in the context of privately? Okay. You as well? Yep. So what do they do? Um, um, you first, since you started. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if everybody heard it, but the idea is you have a particular version of a, what you said, program, right? Yeah. Cool. I'll uh, cite you, so I'll paraphrase you. A particular version of a program, and you want to keep track of individual versions, right? Because you make changes, you run them, and uh, you want to actually perhaps go back because something, a bug that you had in your previous version suddenly vanished, or a new bug has appeared, and you want to see the difference that you actually did half a year ago and actually backtrack and figure out, okay, how do I solve that issue or what introduced the bug, right? So you want to have both versions of it and you use versioning system for that one. You, you had something? Yep. 
Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, cool. So, uh, but uh, the rest of you haven't heard about versioning systems yet, right? So, just a brief no will do. No, no, sh no shaking heads. Cool. Okay. So, the classical version, uh, version control, which is not existing, is that one, right? So, we have Harry and Sally here. I prefer Bob and Alice, but anyway. Um, so, they both have access to a shared repository or some s shared data source. Uh, you see how creative I am. Um, and they're basically reading a document, modifying the document. So let's say Harry opens that document first, writes something to it, and then Sally does the same at the same time. And depending on the order they write, let's say Harry writes, um, writes back um, to the repository and then Sally writes back to the repository, she will have overwritten the original document, right? So if you think about a Windows file share, network share, that kind of stuff, right? So you open the file at the same time and the, l the one that writes the latest version wins generally. So yeah, you lose the version there, right? So you lose all the contribution that Harry has actually made. Not really helpful, particularly if you large work in teams. That's where it comes in, right? So about communication and uh, managing projects in larger teams. The obvious solution is that, well, you could lock the access. And that's precisely what's happening in real life. In Word does it, I think. If you open a file, somebody else opens it as well. It will tell you, well, the file is currently locked by another user. Do you want to read open it at read only? What's the consequence of that? Is that a good model? That's cool. Or alternative, if you want to make changes, you can do it, but... So suddenly you have two versions of the same file, right? So it's not really helpful, right? You guys, everyone got that, right? So that's a bit of an issue there that we are um, um, facing. So, and that is still commonly kind of done, I think, in most um, yeah, business environments. I mean, oftentimes people still work off file shares and have that issue occasionally because as soon as they realize that everyone works in the same document or Excel sheet more commonly, then uh, suddenly things go uh, a bit sideways, right? So, cool. And the, um, the more advanced approach is as follows. is basically you have a shared repository. GitHub is a good example. Does every everyone knows GitHub somehow, right? So in your private life, you have downloaded some software from there and ran it. Yes, no? Cool, yes. So software repository, you download uh, software. Um, they are the idea is that everything is open source, meaning you can inspect the source code. And that makes one thing beautiful, which is versioning. So you have, assuming you have a copy of your source code that is uh, checked out or cloned rather by Harry and uh, Sally in this particular example on the top left here. And um, at this stage, uh, cloning repository means actually having a copy of the full repository, meaning Harry and Sally have a local copy of the GitHub repository in its entirety, including all the old versions, which is pretty cool because you can work on a plane, do commits to your own repository, even though you can't really upload it because you don't have internet or whatever else. So it's quite convenient. So assuming now that Sally actually comes out of the plane, actually um, commits her or rather pushes her changes, that's the term, back to the central repository, Green on green, how brilliant. So, um, central repository, user one, Harry Sally. So they, they work lo locally and basically like a database store um, different versions of their own files, right? So this one commits first into the central repository. However, both of them ultimately need to push their code into a central repository because that's what the entire company, the entire project lives on, right? Because everyone else, perhaps another party also works on that repository. So. If Sally has now pushed at this stage, he will get a um, it's a, a so-called um, um, an out-of-date error. Basically, the repository here indicates, well, actually the version you have been working on was not current. So not only has a newer version been committed, but the version you have originally checked out wasn't current. So basically, what it requires the user to do is to get the recent ver most recent version of that code again even though he or she did changes. And the idea is then that the document is automatically merged, meaning it identifies on line level generally, and um, yeah, generally line level, um, which code lines have been added, which ones have been removed. So basically, he gets all the changes from Sally downloaded, and those are integrated with his latest changes, here Harry in this particular case, and that makes the merge document, which is then pushed into the central repository. So next time Sally checks it out, she gets all the changes of Harry as well. 
So that's the key idea there. So you, you model or you, you handle those conflicts by having a clever system that actually tells you, hey, hang on, there are changes you need to think about and integrate it. Obviously, those systems only work well for what kind of files? Kind of text files, right? Why? Exactly, right, yeah. Exactly. So as soon as you deal with um, more advanced encodings or media encodings, text for example, but also binaries, um, and you inspect the, the content, it doesn't really make sense anyway, right? So it's all over the place. You can actually do, can't do a meaningful comparison. You can do a comparison uh, on the binaries or you can keep binaries and run them individually, but you can't actually see the code differences. You that's why you will only use it on documents or source code directly. So you can s navigate through changes in source code. That's what's referred to as versioning systems. So you don't overwrite somebody else's copy. You don't lock another person's copy. You keep that independence, but you need to integrate changes that have been made over time. Yeah? So it's the key idea. Two solutions are, or many solutions are out there. The most uh, prominent one is probably Git nowadays. Does anyone know who developed this thing? Git? Why? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I'm not sure if you. Yeah, I just uh, again I will paraphrase you. Um, the response was Linus Torvalds, basically a founder of Linux, and uh, at that time um, he was writing. It was in 2005, I believe. And he had been writing the Linux kernel for some time and had got some traction of people contributing to it. And he was uh, annoyed about the painfully slow experience he had with CVS, I think. He no, he was using Bazaar, some other protocol, which was painfully slow. So he invented uh, Git as well for his own kernel. And this pretty much has become a standard in versioning uh, control systems nowadays. Earlier versions such as SVN weren't as clever. What they had was a shared repository, but you wouldn't be able to commit your own versions locally. You will always need to have internet connection to actually commit the latest version of your document. Whereas in this case, you can have inter versions stored locally before you push one large chunk over the wire. Uh, consideration if you have interrupted connectivity. Anyway, cool. That was a bit of an excursus, but it's more like uh, getting, into the getting you into that, that, that uh, giving you this technological backdrop of how to manage the documents properly. Ultimately, you are IT professionals, so you're not just managing documents, you actually want to do it in a um, meaningful sense. Cool. But uh, looking at um, documents more generally in terms of um, design or um, um, game design and specification, it's important to identify the coo two key purposes. One of them, again, is documentation. Um, and which reflects some notion of memory, right? because we want to keep track of what actually happened over time, decisions that have been made, and how the game is going to be developed, the vision of the game. But the other thing is obviously also communication. So if a new t team member joins the team, or you know, is you know, substituted or becomes sick or whatever else, it's relatively easy to recover um, or get an introduction of what the game is actually about, right? By just reading a documentation. So it should be relatively straightforward. Um, but the challenge is that, that's probably the biggest problem here, that we have an awful lot of different um, documents that need we need to maintain. Recall that we came up with a wide set of different roles of individuals that are involved in game development, and nearly equally that number needs to be supported with some sort of suitable documentation. So it may act actually be the either on a design level, which attracts artists and designers in particular, reflects aspects such as scripting as opposed to uh, guidelines for um, aesthetic appearance, so for representation. Then the technical documents. What do you think is in technical documents? What are the kind of things that are documented in technical documentation? Database, yeah. Okay, database, yeah. Data structures, perhaps, yeah. What else? For gamers, particular, yep. I didn't get that. Crash logs, yeah. So, yeah, some dumps, yeah, memory memory dumps of, of issues, right? Yeah, but um, think more general. You know, just pitching your game, you're starting to develop it. What's the kind of things you need to decide on that should be documented? Exactly. Which programming language do I use? Which engines, graphics engines, do you use, right? What are the other aspects that are related to it? That's versions yeah but think about i'm not sure you guys are a bit young hopefully but if in the old versions when you had a game you the first thing what would was the first thing you would do when you look at the new game that's sitting in the shelf 
exactly. You check the system's requirements, right? So those are kind of things. What are the limitations that my system actually ha or that that this game or the, you know the the, the settings, uh, the ha hardware capability and performance restrictions that need to be uh, met in order to make that game actually viable? And you need to commit to that. Once they are set, they any one of them can't just change them, right? So that's why it's very important to make it clear we can only support that level of complexity, for example, right? So then the artists actually need to admit, oops, we probably won't be able to represent that. Uh, uh, our aspirations are usually pitching a bit higher than that, right? So that's a very technical document. Also, something is the uh, what's called the pipeline. It's about all the process. Um, so how do you actually deploy, you know, uh, um, aspects of um, versioning, as you mentioned, testing, continuous integration, how it's hosted, you know, is it Steam uh, based or is it, are we hosting our own service and server? How do we distribute it by download, CD? Well, it doesn't exist anymore, Blu-ray. Um, so, you know, what's, what's the mode of distribution as well or app stores and so on. All those kind of aspects should be covered. Then there's the management bit and um, the obvious public. We get to that uh, in a sec. What is part of the documentation or the, yeah, documentation for the uh, public? What kind of stuff would you expect there? What kind of documents? So some sort of hype documents, right? So that pitch the storyline of the game. Um, um, highlight the characters, perhaps even secondary literature, right? So you could have a fan community that you're starting to build. So you actually have a game, but suddenly around it you have, I don't know, some comics around it as well, or a book even, or TV show, or I don't know. So it all relates to that uh, outward-facing uh, notion, right? Building communities and um, producing some sort of hype, perhaps, yep. Ah, very good, very good, very good. That's I hope everyone got this. It's a really good point. Earlier, um, the development cycle, right? So we want to give potential interested uh, early adopters an opportunity to know when they can actually test that game already, right? And they will actually work, do the work for you. If your game is reasonably good, they will create their own walkthroughs or whatever else and post it somewhere, make it available on YouTube and so on. So actually, they're doing the work for you, right? Very good. So actually, have some sort of integration with the um, um, design aspects of the game, right? So managing the cycle or management aspects as well. Cool. So it's somewhat interlinked. But those are the four rough categories we're dealing with. So design, it's more like the gameplay, aesthetics aspects, uh, technical, so what are the hard technical constraints and decisions made? It's a very important one. Management, it's about communication to uh, your managers in particular or the funders, and then obviously any stakeholder like the public, right? So those would be the, the, the possible contents. So the first um, would be a game design overview, detailed design documents, and a story overview and so on. I'll probably not run through those individually because it's kind of super obvious, I think, if I think, uh, quite straightforward as part of this. Um, more important is really that I personally have a tendency to look at those things more um, scrutinously, like the technical documents and the requirements need to be well des uh, designed. What's the, what's the kind of challenges we're dealing with, what are potential networking issues, what are do's and don'ts for the art team, what can't we support, what, you know, uh, formats, for example, right, so um, um, of the of the produced um, sketches and so on, and what are other uh, system limitations, hardcore quantified systems limitations. Then there's the notion of the um, art bible. You guys know the art bible? What is this? No? It's basically a reference guide in a widest sense that reflects the style of the art that is used as part of the game. So you have exemplified uh, player characters, how they look like. It's not necessarily codified in, the in, a, in a textual sense, but often using uh, um, visual impressions, right? So the color set that is used, uh, effects that are used in the game potentially, um, um, logos, styles, branding of the entire game is uh, character there, characterized there. Basically, any element that you would encou encounter in the game should be somewhat found in the Bible, because if you use that element a second time, you should reference it from the Bible again, so it's consistent throughout your game. Particularly if your game consists of multiple levels, surprise, surprise, or is sufficiently large, it's very important to ensure, ensure consistency. You don't want to be able to identify that this part has been written by that developer, and the other part, next level, has been written by a totally different one. Right? So it's like a way of syncing the aesthetics of a particular game, 
um, which is somewhat challenges, and including obviously animations as well. What are the boundaries um, of characters? How far can they move, right? So what actions can they take in the first place, right? And within those uh, constraints, any character needs to operate because that may be tied again to the technical constraints such as the chosen graphics engine uh, or the physics concepts um, that are um, supported. Cool. cool. Um, yeah, further documents include um, obviously budgeting, which we kind of uh, talked about somewhat, but a very high level. Again, we are probably more on the coder side of things, but it's something to always bear in mind if you're thinking about coming and setting up your own game studio, getting a good feel of what your time estimates uh, are. And I think this is something very, very practical uh, also for you as a coder. When you start doing your own projects, be it pet projects or being at uh, university projects for your you know, various papers, try to get a grasp of how much time you take to do things you know uh, i would try to work on your prediction uh, ability in the widest sense so for example you know you have a particular task to solve and you say ah oh, well take me it will take me two hours so you, s you basically write down how long or your prediction of how long it will take you estimate and then actually validate it and see wha what what you come up with in the end and the learning effect there is a quite secondary one in fact you get a much better um, metacognitive understanding of how you actually work and how fast, how efficient you are. In the future, we'll be much better at guessing your own uh, performance. So it's much more accurate um, to, to actually predict how long you will take to do implement a particular uh, tool task or perfor perform partic particular task as well. Especially if you build levels and so on, it's good to time yourself because then you can predict how much it will be how much time will it will take to actually create yet another level, for example, right? So get pr predictability. But this is independent of game development. That is for uh, any of your coding activity. Try to get a hang of it, how you know productive you are or how, how good your estimate about yourself actually is. So then there's uh, aspects of project planning and schedule that are defined. It really depends on the kind of team you're working in. If you have more agile development teams, they have a very regular meeting cycle, in fact, nearly daily. Um, but it's kind of dynamic in, in terms of the task allocation and star spe task specification. So it's not necessarily hard and fast. This is more like a management-focused uh, document because they want to have clear cut, well-defined plans and so on. But the reality is usually a bit more, a bit dirtier, at least in technical teams, um, as far as I've observed. Cool. Um, you obviously need to write um, documents that are have direct input into the game. So, for example, the story Bible. <coughs> which highlights the you know m main uh, narrative of the entire game and actually influences it it may actually needs to be needs to be adjusted over time depending on your uh, progress and technical constraints you're facing perhaps your engine graphics engine doesn't support that particular feature you're requiring and so on um, but it also requires constant revision so it needs to be really up to date um, in in order to reflect what your gameplay is actually about Kind of the obvious ones are non-player uh, character dialogues, for example, they need to be actually scripted, so you have direct input into the game, and um, the uh, task of writing the tutorials and manuals, right? So it's a bit more public-facing or player-facing in the widest sense, um, quite relevant documents as well, but not so much focus on management or aesthetics, was really for the user directly. And then, as you guys mentioned collectively pretty much before, a lot of public documents. I guess a website is super important, setting up early, getting a copyright domain, all that kind of stuff. In fact, that's something that probably should start at the very start of the entire game development, um, just to uh, be ensure that you actually to ensure that you actually get the website you want, for example, and start recruiting interest, beta testers like by uh, publishing your deployment cycles, um, and some you know community building activities um, is probably quite quite helpful as well. Hopefully the first one is done for you, so the early adopters may just write a walkthrough uh, um, for your game or you know, share their experience or otherwise um, wire channels of their choice. So that's uh, definitely in your interest to have that community running on its own because it doesn't cost you anything, but it can damage you quickly. So it's the negative effect of word of mouth. And then the manuals and fan fiction is obviously something to promote as well, either by secondary products, now again, mentioned movies, books, anything else that's related to its comics. Uh, and there's also a notion of faking community. So some companies actually put money into uh, setting up fora or forums, whatever the plural may be, uh, and actually faking contributions to it. So they actually have a perception of a community that's not really existing just to have the pull factor. Please. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's, um, you, get, you earn quite some good money for that, eh? 
if you because the this is basically kind of in the meantime pretty much an occupation right so contributing to um game communities if you are involved particularly if you have high reputation as a um as a member of a particular community cool um that's it pretty much from my side there so enough talking questions from your side before i leave you in peace thoughts questions teams quite straightforward right no magic so uh, team composition team challenges try to apply perhaps some elements of that ah one pointer in the um in blackboard you'll find a link to a game uh, design guideline the game design template and that's something you could actually use to describe your game when you're for your submission for assignment one it's linked there it's by uh um it, no it's, it should be in week three i'll just briefly bring it up if you in case you haven't opened blackboard yet Generally, the learning material is under, well, learning material, and then there should be a week three folder which contains uh, game design documents, basically a link to a wide range of design documents. And in fact, even if you're not now super keen reading templates, it's really worthwhile looking actually into some of those uh, documents because they describe actual games, like, you know, Doom, for example, is described there. Um, and other games you may actually know. I came across the one of Half-Life, um, the... Um, the 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 the, the g d design guidelines and so on and the bottom one here by Chris Taylor that's basically just a template that you can use to actually describe your game but it's a good way of looking at the different dimensions of how you actually need to comprehensively describe a game so uh, something you for you guys to do as well um, but this pretty much is ev everything for today thank you for your attention um, by the way the ones that don't have group assignments please uh, see Simon he'll make that happen for you put you into particular groups assign you animals whether you want or not and hopefully get out of his office before five. Good luck. So.